I don't know if this is a question or a comment, but uh, yeah, I looked at class one through seven, and yeah, you know, I don't think you know you can put any type of camouflage, you know, when you have a, such a high tower, you know, in your backyard or in front yard. Uh, so I kind of you know uh, uh, see your um, you know uh, comments uh, justified. Now, as far as the um, uh, the I guess uh, some of the checkpoints that's, that's in the ordinance are is an alternative site and the gap analysis and all this, which will give us tool uh, in the planning commission to uh, really uh, restrict, uh, you know, uh, the, I guess, installation of these towers. So I, I think, you know, those things are being addressed um, so that, you know, we, have, we do have some control. Now, at the, at the I guess, uh, the absolute, uh, I guess, case where it has to go in the residential, and I, I think, you know, you're bringing those things up where it has to go in the residential. What is the setback? And th th those are being addressed. So maybe that's something that you might want to address later on, too. Thank you. Well, um, just a moment. Uh, restate what you had said about the zero setback as it relates to a house. Or was so, it a property line? I wasn't sure what you were saying there because I definitely want, you know, our consultants to clarify how it's put into the ordinance. They've heard me say this before, so it's not, you know, it's, it's not new, but I know it's new for some of you. Um, what we're saying is basically um, a distance between the edge of your property and where a three, four, five giant monolithic statue is going to be. That's not a beautiful So you're talking statue. about property line setback. Yeah, okay. so we're, we're talking about that, yeah. All right. And we were talking before because a lot of the setbacks are actually underneath lawns and, and you know, in, in, in our area. Yeah, I have one more question. Uh, sure. Um, well, I would, it, for me, it would have been more helpful if you'd said on this page in the code, this is where I would recommend that, that this change was made. Because it's, even though it's 10 copies 10 times and different things, it, it would have made it a lot easier for us to look at that and to see where that is. So in the future, if you do have those recommendations on making changes to the, to the actual ordinance, it would be helpful for us to see where it is. We could look it up. Cite the paragraph. To cite the paragraph. Yeah, we can definitely redline an agreement and provide it. Do you want? Do you want me? Do you want our relationship to, to expand to that? <laughs> well, it actually would have been. It would have been. Is helpful there an for announcement us. to be made here? <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'd second. Like you all can deal with that afterwards. <laughs> Mr. Lee has another question. Well, I think it's more towards the Mr. Kramer. Uh, Mr. Uh, you know, when the towers are less in, in the uh, residential area, maybe some residents might want that. Is there a compensation from the uh, cell tower company uh, to compensate to put this tower in their backyard? Or, right. So, you know, so now if, if that's the case, then, you know, the neighbors might have a problem with that tower going in because of, you know, the four extra money that, you know, he's going to earn from putting the you know, cell tower in there. You know, he'll probably want it in, in his backyard. So I think that might have to be addressed where, you know, uh, you know, the property owner might be okay with that, but the, but neighbors. We see that, like, with commercial properties adjacent to residential, for sure. example. Right. You know, they get, you know, the church gets the money, but the residences around it get to see a cell tower. Exactly. Okay. So. Uh, next speaker, Michael Hunt. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, and City staff. Um, I'd like to thank you for your time and your attention uh, to these matters. And Ms. Sansoni, I think, has done a tremendous job over the last, uh, what, year and a half <laughs> you've been working on this. Um, I would like to request that uh, when there is, uh, that there's a larger notification area. Currently, it's set at 500 feet. Um, I did a little site map today from Cumberland and Brockmont, and uh, if they were to go to a, a place where there is not a sidewalk, and if you were to go 500 feet, you wouldn't go a block and a half or be, or be notifying 45 residents. Um, that's about two blocks shy of uh, where Mr. McMahon's uh, property is. So he wouldn't even know if they were doing it two blocks away from where he lived. Um, the cell companies have done a rather um, deceitful job of when they had self-notification of construction going on, they wouldn't even mention that it was for a cell, for cellular companies. They would just go ahead and give a notification saying, well, we're going to be doing some uh, work in the easement. And, uh, and fortunately, uh, Mr. McMahon caught on to that and uh, has really uh, done a very, well, very good job. Um, I'd also like to request that... Uh, that uh, 15 feet or 75% uh, of the height is, uh, is adopted into that ordinance as well. That would also uh, take care of the situation where we talked about where one property owner would say, yes, I want it on my, on my land. 
but and then not the adjacent one because then it would be right dead center in the middle of his backyard. That would help eliminate that problem. Um, I'm a commercial general contractor here in uh, Glendale. I've been in, uh, been working here for 25 years. There are codes and uh, compliance issues as far as like air conditioning screening and things like that that ha that take these and take those materials where you can't see an air conditioner sitting up on a roof. I don't see the reason for allowing them to be mounted on the side of buildings uh, in the public right away where people need to see where people need to see them. They can be concealed and it, and still be able to get the coverages that they need. Um, the gentleman from AT and T had mentioned uh, about. Uh, how uh, the public demand is more. These are for profit business. The public demand for AT&T is greater now because of the iPhone. Uh, it's not that they didn't have good coverage to begin with. They've just had a very successful business relationship, which now they want to expand that relationship to make more money for their shareholders, understandably. Um, Um, well, I lost my place here, I'm sorry. Oh, the, uh, the setback uh, notifications, again, keep in mind that that was held, upheld by, the, by San Diego. Uh, that was the ordinance by the Ninth, by the ninth Circuit. And um, uh, Ms. Sansoni had mentioned uh, something else that I think was very important in her earlier conversations where she had brought up about uh, renderings or markups or, or mock-ups. I think that if they are going to propose a site in a public right away, that they need to at that site do a public notification and a mock-up of what the product's going to look like, so the public can see is this intrusive to us, and be able to come to a hearing with you, with you guys and be able to say, um, you know, it's uh, now you know what it's really going to look like. Um, I'd like to re recommend that that notification period or the notification area be extended from 500 feet to 1,000 feet squared. So 1,000 feet any direction from the property, those residents would be notified, that, uh, and which I think is a reasonable distance, which equates to about four city blocks rather than the block and a half that 500 feet would be. Um, I need to ask you to wrap up your comments. Okay. Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, last closing. One last comment? Fair enough. Okay, one last comment. Um, when they talk about propagation maps, it's kind of, it's kind of similar to Ross Perot when he would say, well, I'll make a graph. And if that graph doesn't work, well, I'll make a new graph. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, thank you. Thank Can I you. Ask him one question? Uh, yes, a question yes. for the speaker. When you say um, at the posting site, do you mean a rendering or do you mean like story poles? What were you were you? I was thinking a rendering of 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 what uh, similar to facility similar, similar that to would the, be a scale the drawing would be like a photoshopped in thing. Sure, similar similar to what you have here for the sale of apartments, just a rendering on the on the hearing notification, so that somebody could either see what it's going to look like, uh, of, of what they're proposing for that site. I'll give you one quick example. In Kenneth Village, they did a uh, a cell site in Kenneth Village in one of the businesses. They have then gone and done a co-locate. When they did the co-locate, they went on the outside of the building and they put all the antennas on the outside of the building facing the little net, the, the one block area of Kenneth Village. So when you walk out of the stores or when you're going there to the little bakery, you're sitting there having your coffee, you're looking up at the side at the facade of the building, it's full of cell, it's full of, uh, of cell yes. items. I think that that would be something that would be a very helpful tool for you guys to utilize as well when you're reviewing these uh, applications. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is uh, Jamie T. Hall. Hello. Um, my name is Jamie uh, T. Hall. Um, I'm here um, speaking on behalf of the California Wireless Association. Um, we're an organization made up of volunteers from uh, the wireless industry. Um, we've actually been following this item for uh, since pretty much it came up, um, um, following the wireless moratorium and the drafting of the new ordinance. And um, we actually um, prepared comments and attended some of the, um, the community meetings on this um, matter. So I'm going to make my comments pretty brief since we already provided comments and staff has responded to those comments. Um, I really just want to focus on one central message, and um, that's um, that this ordinance is extremely restrictive, and it's very strict. 
and it's going to make it more difficult to deploy wireless services in the city of Glendale. Um, I don't think anyone can really refute that today. Um, this is a, a strict ordinance. That's what council directed staff to do, and staff did an admiral job at drafting the most restrictive ordinance they possibly could under federal and state law. The irony here is that where services are needed the most is in or near residential zones. And if you look at the ordinance, that's the most restrictive place. I mean, the most strict restrictive um, standards are employed in or near residential zones. Um, consumers are demanding services in these zones the most, and that's something that this ordinance um, can't change. It's just the fact. People are using their devices in different ways. We're not using them merely for voice calls. We're using them for um, to send and receive emails, to check the Internet, to watch mobile television, whether or not you think that's a noble goal or not. Um, that's what people are using their devices for. As AT&T's representative said, their data um, and their usage has quadrupled in the last year. And this means that we need more capacity. And that's the conundrum that we're really in here. And I just really want everyone to understand that we're creating a conundrum with this ordinance. If you're, you know that you're going to need services in or near residential zones because that's where people are demanding the services. And yet we have an ordinance here that creates a huge barrier that says if you choose to try to serve those consumers in or near residential zones, we're going to make it as po hard as we possibly can. So that's the message I just want to deliver tonight. Um, I think it's admirable that... Um, the city wants good sites, and I don't think anyone in this industry um, would refute that. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but when that rises to the level of actually hampering the provision of wireless services, then I don't think that's a laudable goal, and I don't think that should be a policy objective that um, any jurisdiction should really um, try to implement. So... Um, and the other issue I'd like to just briefly note is the um, FCC shot clock ruling that recently came out, and I understand that uh, local governments are challenging that, but right now it is in effect. And that requires municipalities to process permits within a certain time frame once they are deemed complete. So if someone comes and files a complete application, you have 90 days for a co-location and 150 days for a new facility. Now, the ordinance is drafted in such a way that the overwhelming majority of applications, because they're necessarily not going to be able to go all in commercial or industrial zones, they're going to have to go to the Planning Commission because they're going to be in the sensitive use areas, right? So I just want everyone to know from a practical standpoint what that means. It means that you're going to have a lot of applications coming before this body and you're going to be required to process them within 90 or 150 days after a complete application is filed. So I just want to make that clear. Be prepared for that. Um, and on the setback issue and the public right-of-way, I know that we're not dealing with an ordinance right now that deals with the right-of-way, but people keep bringing it up, so I feel compelled to address it. The reason why the setback requirement is so problematic is that under state law, a telephone corporation has the right, they have a statewide franchise to access the public right of way. So when you have, um, and so that's why you can't impose a setback that would prohibit you, or that would keep a wireless carrier or a telephone corporation from, from going in the public right of way. If that setback is going to completely prohibit you from going there, then that violates state law. And I think that's one of the reasons why staff was careful and not um, um, putting a setback that would basically set up a, a major legal problem. Um, so I think I will conclude my comments there. Thank you um, for listening to me. I know this is difficult. I absolutely know that. Um, but I appreciate your time. Thank you. Mr. Lee? Question. Oh, I'm sorry. And then you. Mr. Oh, Lee? Yeah, okay. Um, I just have a, you know, because you represent the Wireless Association, uh, and this might be a question towards, uh, you know, the other uh, wireless people as well. Uh, you know, we're setting up these cell towers because of demand and also coverage areas and all that. 
Uh, I'm just throwing this question out there. Is there a technology, how, and how far is it away that if you have a, you know, cell towers in a more, uh, I guess, uh, you know, distant uh, you know, part that could cover a much larger radius? I guess what I'd like to um, communicate, and if anyone and try to get people to understand is that in the in the begin and I'm sure Jonathan Jonathan can explain this but in the very beginning of the you know commercial commercial mobile radio services maybe towers were on the fringes to provide coverage to a community and it didn't take a whole bunch of towers and that was one of the reasons why is that you were using your cell phone for one purpose to place a phone call period but we're using our cell phones in different ways and so what that means is that we need to have sites closer to where people are actually using those devices. So it's actually working the opposite direction, and that's why we're seeing this tension. I mean, honestly, that's why we're here tonight. This is what, tri what happened, and this is why we're here. It's a, it's a tension. So I guess the question I'm asking is that with all this, uh, you know, technologies, you know, defense technologies that's coming up and all that, we do not have a super antenna? That, no. no. There's no magic bullet. And so that's really, I, I, I've even thought about using that word. You know, just setting up an ordinance that keeps you from going in or near residential zones isn't going to solve this problem. It, it's, it's, there's no magic bullet. We may have an ordinance that, that meets all of the constituent demands, but it's not going to change the fact that people are demanding services in precisely the area where it's the ordinance doesn't want you to go. I mean, that's the conundrum. So, so are you saying then that, just to carry that thought a little further, you're saying that the, the, the technology is changing and, and the usage requirements are changing to the extent that the whole idea of having wireless and not, in have, not having infrastructure is going to the point that we'll have massive amounts of infrastructure like poles and lines and such. Is it going to continue to get that way or is there a limitation? I think, I think that's where Mr. Lee was coming from, that... Is well, the, technology, the cellular technology was such that there was a, a certain amount of space that a cell would cover, mm -hmm. and then you'd go to the next cell. Has that changed? It, is it is it going down in size, or is well, you're the having more focus. The cells could be larger. It's more focused. Um, you know, a site now is going to cover a smaller area because it's trying to meet all of those consumer demands. People using it for different. Uh, it, the sites are generally coming they're, sm they're cl coming lower lower in height and closer to where people are using them and so it's it's there's no super antenna there's no super tall tower that can be on the outside of town that could like serve everybody it's it's working in the opposite direction <laughs> and that's just the central and all you have to do is look at the zoning map of the city and you can see that most properties are zoned residential Okay. So we, it's a conundrum. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to get an idea, get a better idea of um, the Cal Wireless Association. You said you're a volunteer. Yes, I am. Them, but I'm also an attorney. Okay. Um, but this is a organization of, it's a volunteer organization um, with um, people who work in different um, different companies, law firms, vendors. Um, we was formed a couple of years ago. Um, and it's um, affiliated with uh, the PCIA, which is a nationwide organization. I guess, you know, the, the, I guess what I'm trying to really understand is that we're setting all these audiences and all that. And whereas I know 10 years ago, when you, if you had wanted to uh, store 2 gig, you had this big old uh, hard disk. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a 4 gig yeah. uh, stick. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Uh, so, you know, we have that type of technology. And I, I was just wondering, you know, you know, you are in the industry, so if there is that type of technology that's coming through, really all this, you know, the conversation that we're having is, uh, is you know. Well, sites really are getting better. We know that, right? We, we saw pictures of better sites. And, uh, and antennas are changing, and they're getting smaller. Um, but that's not going to change the location. But as far as you know, that the there's location. No, no technology. Uh, no technology the, to, the horizon. to keep these things out from where people are using them. That's, we can make these things look prettier. We can do good planning, and we're, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a laudable objective. But the problem is where you think that you're only going to be able to put them in commercial or industrial areas, and that will just solve everyone's problems. It will not solve those problems, and no one should be under those illusions. So are there... 
You're saying no technologies are coming up, you're saying, as far as maybe I mean, we can entertain at all, that you know of at all? I mean, I'm, honestly, I mean, I, I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, and I'm not an um, engineer either, but um, I do know that, you know, 3G and 4G is being, you know, rolled out, and um, I haven't heard of there being a magic solution. Um, There's not an eye pole out there? No. <laughs> <laughs> there is. They release it next year. Yeah. Good. <laughs> But it's going in your yard. Mr. Roche would probably know about that, I suppose, right? That's ATT? Right. I think everybody would want that, too. Yeah. <laughs> backyard. It's the marketing of design. All right, moving on. Thank you, moving very, on. Much. Thank you right. very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker card is uh, Myrna Stanley. Good evening, Mr. Uh, Chairman Kane and commissioners and staff, and I can't believe we've been here this long. My name is Myrna Stanley. I'm president of the Verdugo Woodlands Homeowners Association, and I'm speaking on behalf of my board. Um, I, I apologize. My printer decided not to work today, so I, I'm referring to page two of the staff report where it says the new application um, um, requirements and it, it says applications for WTF permits will require in addition to the basic application the following information and then it goes on to list 10 items it's, I don't know what the basic application requires so I, just for the record I, I'd like to ask that it include that the, any plans show slopes and contours and other pertinent physical features existing and proposed and that um, any tree within 50 feet of a proposed site be indicated uh, on the on their plans, and that the base of the um, of this site be stealth as well as the the antenna portion of it. Um, on page 86, I just remember it was page 86. I don't have it with me, but um, they're talking about water towers and the uh, PowerPoint presentation that you showed for preferred locations. The first one was water towers. And I have to tell you, uh, Ms. Sansone, I'm sure, would remember that years ago in the Verdugo Woodlands, uh, Pac Bell proposed to install um, a cell site on a water tower off Hermosita in the hillside. And they're all in hillsides. Um, and they've been abandoned by the city eons ago. So. <laughs> Long story short is that's how w the first telecommunications ordinance of the city was established because of that. Pac Bell, I guess, got tired and they went away. They now and they insisted that we were restricting them and prohibiting them from from doing business and yada yada. They now have wonderful coverage in the woodlands. I don't know where they went or what they did, but they have coverage. So. What I'm asking that you do is delete water towers from your preferred list or add language water towers in non-residential areas, but that's not going to make any sense because they're all in residential areas and they're in the steep areas. The one on Hermosita Drive, there's no, there, there aren't any public access or certainly no vehicular access to these towers. So you're going to have to either grade, go with machines, you're going to have to hand shovel all the way up to these water towers and because and th these carriers are going to have to inspect these facilities monthly. This is a wildlife corridor, the one in particular that I'm talking about, probably so are the other ones in the hillside areas. So what we're asking, if if you don't eliminate it and we have a project that comes before you for a water tower in a hillside area, we're coming up here with two strikes. So we're asking please eliminate it from the preferred list. Thank you. Ms. Stanley, a question. Ms. Stanley. Yes. Ms. Stanley, um, so I uh, totally appreciate your suggestion to add to this, but uh, based upon your very last comment, do you not think we should require a grading uh, plan of any proposed grading to, for the improvements? Oh, it, well, first of all, the minute you say grading to, to I mean, all kinds of red flags go up. You, there are all kinds of requirements that you should require if you're, if, Water towers are going to be on the preferred list, and even if they're not, yes. But that would that also covers areas that are in the ROS zone and and hillside zone. So would hillside 
this hillside need to have a separate it's just a thought well they're they're very sensitive sites as you know um, and when you talk about grading in hillside areas it, it, all kinds of th things happen and, 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 and especially with our wildlife up there so <coughs> if, you, if you could eliminate it I think you could be you would be helping all of us and they would the carries would still be able to obviously come and propose their sites on those towers but I'm sure they're salivating I mean you'll get one you're going to get five six others to come up and co-locate uh, just one last question mm -hmm. on that. Do you think that uh, the CEQA process is, is enough of a deterrent for people to do that so that you would have to mitigate wildlife corridors, habitat, anything else that you would? Well, you know, the CEQA process, it was brought up in the, in the first project on Hermosita Drive, but um, and people started saying, you give us proof it's a wildlife project. It just went on and on and on and on for over a year. And as I said, what happened was the first telecommunication ordinance. So... I think that's a good start is to get it off the list. And then I think once it has to come to the Planning Commission, staff, of course, will see the CEQA process is um, taken care of. Thank, thank you. you. And I guess my only comment, you, you, thank you, you can sit down, was you were using the phrase tower, and you meant tank, and the rule says tank. Because there's obviously a difference between a water tower and a tank. Well, it is. Are the and it, it says tank. So okay, okay. You, what you meant was fine, but you were saying tower when you really were... You're tank. right. Thank you. Um, next speaker card is Lawrence Kalfain. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission, City staff. Uh, my name is Lawrence Kalfain. I'm a resident of North Pacific Avenue and vice president of the Northwest Glendale Homeowners Association. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Christina Sansoni and the staff, the planning department, and the um, the outside consultants and council for the tremendous effort that they've put into the research and preparation of this ordinance. It's a tremendous amount of work, and and I'm most grateful for the efforts. Um, in um, uh, seeing the presentation this evening, I noticed the same thing that Mr. McMahon had commented on: is that the um, class classes one through seven type of wireless transmission facilities. Um, are installations mainly on private property, on the side of an office building, behind a shopping center sign, and that sort of thing. But where um, I believe the ordinance still calls for some additional attention is in the protection of the rights of residents who are faced with a public right-of-way installation directly in front of their home, which is the very issue that sparked the public outcry over this issue in the first place, um, which was a huge light standard uh, that was going to be installed in front of a home, Mr. McMahon's home on Cumberland Drive, and the accompanying refrigerator-sized cabinets that um, were going to be installed in front of a neighboring property right across the street. Um, those huge cabinets that we've seen sprout up in the parkways all over the city. Um, <clears throat> With the, the recent October uh, 2009 Ninth Circuit decision in Sprint versus Palos Verdes Estates, um, it appears to affirm the city's uh, right to assert control over the placement of wireless facilities in the public right-of-way on the basis of aesthetics. And um, uh, so it, it seems to me that this gives the city an opportunity to address some of the um, concerns that we have um, about... Um, strengthening the ordinance. And in fact, we've just seen this week in Glendale and reported in today's news press, um, even when living trees are planted in the public right-of-way in, in front of someone's home, the residents can get very upset <coughs> if they've had no um, uh, say-so in the process. Um, so not only, uh, well, a number of the speakers have um, commented on the need for an expanded geographic uh, notification area. I would also call for um, public hearings for applications in the public right-of-way as well. Um, thank you. Thank you. No questions? All right. And the next speaker card is Elise Kalfayan. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm Elise Kalfayan, and I'm a resident of Northwest Glendale. 
and I appreciate the protections in this ordinance for Title 30 private property cell sites. Um, I want to address Title 12, which is on the agenda and which is what most of the speakers have been talking about tonight, which is public right-of-way installations. Um, this ordinance does not push the envelope over public right-of-way installations in residential areas, and I believe it should. California Public Utilities Code Section 7901 is not the obstacle that it was just a few months ago. Court cases are going in city's favor, as the consultants have told you. We have to comply with federal laws, but Glendale, along with other cities, should stand up to the FCC and the telecom industry, which are on the offense uh, right now against local government control. I petitioned City Council in June 2009 to send a comment for the FCC's National Broadband Plan. And in response, um, Public Works Council Christina Sansone said this in her report to the city. I quote, we should also seek assurances that nothing in the National Broadband Plan should be used to undercut local government's authority with respect to zoning. This plan should not become a vehicle whereby the local jurisdictions are restricted from exercising the rights granted by Congress, unquote. Well, what she warned about is currently happening. The FCC has imposed shot clock time limits for permit processing, forcing a reevaluation of the ordinance in front of you before it could come here tonight. Now, according to the National Association of Telecommunications Officers and Advisors, uh, an organization to which Jonathan Kramer belongs, the FCC may seek cost recovery rules. So at a time when cities like Glendale are facing budget cuts, hiring freezes, and reduced public services, the telecom corporations might benefit at the expense of cities for public right-of-way installations. San Francisco is now considering a new wireless ordinance, and advocates there are suggesting the city increase its fees to pay for staff reviews and the FCC required expediting. Glendale should consider this as well and make sure it gets fair market value for its sites on the public right-of-way, again, Title 12 on your agenda. San Francisco supervisors will also be considering the option of hearings for all wireless facilities proposed for public rights-of-way in residential and neighborhood commercial districts. The Glendale ordinance should do the same. Wireless ordinances for Albany and Richmond forbid installations in residential areas. According to Lena Velasco in Richmond's planning division, they're only allowed if the provider can prove it's not economically or technically feasible to place an installation elsewhere. And why do residents object to these? Um, you know, yes, residents want coverage, but it goes back to um, Commissioner Sheets' question about proliferation and competition. I mean, there could be a, a huge number of sites if every single provider is allowed to place them in the public right-of-way. Other cities are pushing back, and our city officials shouldn't be in the position of telling angry residents they have no recourse. So Glendale should push back, too, by establishing setbacks and hearings for installations in the public right-of-way in residential areas. Thank you. Thank you. The final speaker card I have is Theodore Polychronis. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I shall be brief. I think <laughs> I didn't count the hours. It's almost five hours now. Huh? Okay. Uh, all I have to say is this: it relates to the, especially to, predominantly and primarily to installation of these uh, antennas in the residential districts, and this is something that uh, has caused us a lot of grief here. Uh, I'll go quickly on the things that we want on this ordinance. We want the notification radius to be larger than the 500 feet that uh, you had stated in there. We want it to be probably uh, 1,500 feet. We want the, the uh, notification of a pending installation on both private and public properties to be, to be sent out to the uh, residents. We want two months lead time of advance notice so that uh, we know what uh, is proposed. The notification must include a detailed map of the area 
as is done in other cities, like in the city of Los Angeles, when anything is uh, proposed and uh, they, uh, they want to notify the people. Uh, we want a provision for public hearings for installation of, these, uh, of this equipment on both private property and public property installations because we had a very bad experience which started this whole uh, process when uh, things were done on public property and they were, uh, there was, uh, everything was done in bad faith and uh, people from the city colluded with uh, telecommunications uh, people and through incompetence and uh, bad faith they created a, a very large number of upset people. We want to establish setbacks for public rights of way installations and with the proposal that Mr. McMahon mentioned is um, seems reasonable, 75% uh, of the tower height or at minimum 15 feet from property uh, lines. And then we also want to define the public nuisance and specify that the permitting authority from the city may deny a permit to install antennas and associated equipment in residential areas based on nuisance potential of the, on the residents or revoke the permits of active installations based on nuisance. The reason for this is because most people don't realize that these antennas that these people are proposing to put up are not passive devices. I mean, the antenna itself is, is but it is, rela it is connected to very large pieces of equipment, which a lot of times they bury underground. And uh, correcting Mr. Kalfayan's uh, um, note, the, uh, it's not a refrigerator size. It's, there are vaults that are the size, like from here to the wall, and I don't know, about eight feet deep, and they're very big, and they used uh, several hundred uh, kilowatt hours of power. They use uh, th their uh, refrigeration equipment inside, uh, air conditioners, and God knows what else. They create a tremendous amount of noise. Furthermore, if you have an antenna like this right next to your house, it's operating 24 hours a day. There are maintenance people who may, which may go on uh, work on it at any time and th this is not something that uh, enhances our uh, lifestyle let's say I do need you to conclude your remarks please sir I beg your pardon? I need you to conclude your remarks please well, okay, I'm concluding my remarks. I mean, I just want to uh, make a comment in just because the telecommunications companies want to expand their business, I don't think that they should uh, do that at the expense of all of us. As far as uh, the volunteer gentleman of the, uh, representing the industry, he's so concerned about the service of uh, residential districts, the uh, houses have landlines. If the, their little phones don't work, they can always switch to a more reliable source, which is uh, will uh, accommodate them. Uh, as far as the threat addressed to you, that thousands of applications will come and uh, you'll be um, troubled. Well, hey, we're we're that. here till ten, eleven o'clock <laughs> at night. You know. Thank you very much. That's all. I Thank you, uh, sir. So, no. um, do you have a question? Yeah. It is just to, yeah, to the staff, um, you know, as one of the speakers raised this, um, you know, Title 12, and I know we're not to, you know, discuss that and review this here. And can you remind me again why that was the case? Sure. Um, the Planning Commission is charged under the, under the Municipal Code and uh, with reviewing changes to the Zoning Code, which is Title who, 30. So who reviews Title, title 12? Council. Uh, the City Council. City Council, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I imagine there's closing remarks from staff. I know we have some some responses from the consulting folks. Um, how would you like to play that hand? I think we should go right to the responses to the comments. Very good. At the risk of irritating Mr. Foy, if you will indulge me, I would like to take you on a brief tour of the right-of-way issues because they they do relate they're all part of a, a planning endeavor and I just want you to understand that it isn't as though the ordinance was drafted to create open season in the public right-of-way so if you give me three minutes I'll see if I can walk you through it <laughs> <laughs> 
Well deserved. Okay. First, um, and you can follow along if you if you choose to, but if you go to pages eight and nine of the ordinance, you will find the application requirements for facilities in the public rights of way. And if you look at subparagraph G4, you will see a discussion of what happens for applications for facilities in the public rights of way inside or within 1,000 feet of a residential district. And it says there that in that case, uh, an alternative site analysis shall, speci shall specifically include an evaluation of the availability and feasibility of potential alternative sites located at preferred locations. Now remember that term preferred locations for a moment. And within preferred zones. So if you then take those two special terms, preferred locations and preferred zones, and you turn back to the bottom of page three and the top of page four, you'll find those terms defined. A preferred location is, uh, the first one, is an existing structure, including but not limited to water tanks, and I know there's been some discussion <coughs> about water tanks, utility towers, poles, traffic lights, cobra-style street lights, and roadway overpasses. So these are circumstances where the facility is going on top of a, of a pre-existing pole, no new pole. Um, preferred zones, equally important, you can see the list there. They are the, a variety of C, C zones, most notably no residential zones. So you start with the premise that in order to make an application to put a facility in the public right of way inside a residential district or within 1,000 feet of a residential district, the first thing you have to do is show why it can't go somewhere else. Okay. Then I, I just this, this goes back to some earlier comments, um, I believe, from you, Mr. Sheets, Commissioner Sheets, excuse me. Um, numbers six and seven in the application requirements address pro projection of applicants' future wireless needs and uh, the geographic er service areas to be to be met with the application. Um, then we can go to the findings section for the right of way, and then I promise as soon as I talk about that, I'll move on to zoned property. Um, in the findings section, which you find on pages eleven and twelve of the ordinance, you will see. Um, a series of very relevant findings. The fr these are findings that have to be made with every application in the right-of-way. Number four, the proposed wireless telecommunications facility will not physically or visually interfere with vehicular traffic, pedestrian use of the streets, intersections, and the like. Number six, to the maximum extent reasonably feasible, the proposed facility has been designed to blend with the surrounding area and the facility is appropriately designed for the specific site. Number seven, the proposed facility won't be installed at a prefer will be, if it won't be installed at a preferred location, that installation at a preferred location isn't feasible. And number eight, um, that it won't be a, effectively a high visibility facility. All of these criteria were put in to avoid high source. Um, and to and to have aesthetic considerations taken into account and the need for service taken into account in connection with sites in the right of way and substantially similar requirements are apply on the zoned property and I if if you have a moment I'll walk you through the the findings for the zoned property as well because I think that may be uh, helpful Okay, the, uh, the findings of fact for the zone property are on page 84 of the ordinance um, in section 30.48.40. Um, number one, that to the maximum extent feasible, it's the facilities designed to achieve compatibility with the community. Uh, number two, alternative configurations will not increase, uh, that will not increase com com compatibility, com community compatibility or are not reasonably feasible. Um, then number three, again on alternative locations. Um, uh, number five covers a significant uh, gap in coverage. Uh, number six uh, addresses the the need to, to co-locate. All I'm, I'm attempt I'm, without reading them all to you. The point is to say that none of these applications on zoned property, whether they be in a residential area or in a commercial building immediately adjacent to a residential area 
get through the city process without asking this series of significant questions about A, is there a significant coverage gap, and B, are there questions of community compatibility. Uh, and so these issues are going to get teed up and addressed. The ordinance is conscientiously designed to make sure they do uh, get teed up and addressed through, through the process. So uh, hopefully that gives you a sense of, of, of the controls that exist in the ordinance. I do want to turn to the setback issue for a moment because that's a specific consideration that was raised. Uh, we, we had a dialogue um, at a staff level because we heard some of these comments. Uh, during the uh, during the public hearing process about uh, whether it makes w the wisdom, uh, for lack of a, a more polite description, of having a setback uh, requirement applied. And with regard to the public rights of way, we generally came to the conclusion that <coughs> given the tools that I just described to you about the need for a project to be designed to avoid impacts to the extent feasible in a residential district, that we had sort of the generic tools available to, to the people making those decisions already to deal with making sure that a facility is set back as far from residential property as possible. Um, however, it would be possible, it, it would be possible to put a, a presumptive, what I would call a presumptive requirement in the ordinance, should you choose to do so that would say, okay, it's going to be 15 feet or 75% of the tower height. But I have to tell you that the next words that will follow that will be unless you can't achieve coverage. Um, some, uh, if you, unless um, refusing to allow you to have the site where you propose to put it will deprive you of the ability to have that. So we think that might be a... I don't know if I've said that articulately enough, but the but no matter if you put a hard and fast setback requirement, you have to the next thing you have to do is create an exception to that setback requirement that accommodates the circumstance where that exception is necessary to to avoid a significant coverage gap. So you would have to you'd have to achieve that. Um, we think at a staff level that <coughs> tools that are already in the ordinance help you get to the very same place without having to create that presumptive requirement and exception process, which is a little cumbersome. Mr. Lee? I, I have a question on that, you know, uh, setback. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. you make it sound as though this, you know, the coverage um, of the 15, you know, 15 feet setback or, you know, 50 feet setback, I would think that, you know, the, the coverage area radius, you know, is such a, you know, large area that you don't, you don't have the finite where you is affected by 15 feet or 50 feet. I, I am so pleased that you raised that point um, because I, I, it, first it's true. And second, it really does emphasize a reality. Uh, I don't want you to, to leave this evening with the impression that there is only one or two solutions to coverage gap problems. There are many, many solutions. In fact, Mr. Hall, who I think spoke eloquently, talked about, after telling you that there was no magic solution, the next words coming from him were that the facilities are getting smaller and they're getting less visible all the time. And, that, and that's, that's true. And, and Jonathan speaks better to these types of issues than I do, but I will tell you that there are other things happening as well. Um, we have distributed antenna service providers who are people that provide service to all the cell companies from a single antenna instead of having to co-locate six antennas in one place. Uh, we have something called femto cells which don't impact the analysis of the ordinance at all. The law prohibits you from considering femto cells for purposes of the ordinance. But let me tell you what they are. They're just little devices that you plug into your cable outlet at your house and they create like a little micro cell inside the confines of your home and help expand options for wireless coverage in residential areas. So these, these types of devices are out there. And so the, coming back to your question about setbacks, yes, if you were to create a 15 foot or 75% of the height requirement, presumptive requirement, in many circumstances, you would expect that people would find solutions that could comply with that requirement. I have to say, in some circumstances, the, the, you would find people certain uh, realities that wouldn't allow you to comply with that requirement in residential areas where maybe it's just too difficult to get that far back from a residential building and provide any coverage. But that's a context-specific uh, determination, and certainly within the purview of the commission to to create that requirement, again, as long as the, the safety valve is created uh, to the requirement. Um, 
Mr. Roach spoke about significant coverage gaps. He was the first person to speak. Uh, and I think I've, I've sort of covered that issue. You asked me to kind of address, I think, whether the things he was saying about coverage at different times of the day uh, were consistent with the things I was saying. And I, as, as I think you perceive, the two, the two issues are the same. The simple fact of the matter is the issue, the existence or non-existence of a significant coverage gap is a context-specific, case-specific determination, and there's just a variety of factors that you would look at. We didn't even talk about some of them earlier. Like, well, what would the standard be? Is it enough that you have coverage in your front yard, or do you need to have it in your, in your living room, or do you need to have it in the bathroom, in the interior of your house? These are the kinds of issues that actually are being litigated. There's a case out of, I think, Vermont or New Hampshire last year that started talking about, you know, how much coverage is sufficient coverage um, in terms of the quality of service. There was a question about RF compliance reports and whether our protocol was consistent with federal law. To be clear on this, and, and Jonathan can emphasize the point if he chooses, the reports that are required under the telecommunications ordinance are reports that simply verify factually that the facility is in compliance with federal standards. The city doesn't, because it can't, attempt to impose any additional standards above federal standards on, on radio frequency emissions. It just can't. Um, Ms. Daigle made, it, made the comment about, uh, about the ordinance needing to be s simple, and it, Mr. Chair, I think you addressed the point, the same point I was going to make. Uh, this ordinance is largely comprised of uh, material that isn't being amended. Large space. Yeah. Um, there was a question about bonds and insurance. Um, and I want to make sure I address this, er this, this as specifically as I can. The first thing that I'd like you to know <clears throat> is that this ordinance proposes no changes to the bonding requirements and no changes to the insurance requirements. It simply incorporates the same bonding requirements and same insurance requirements that have always been used and are used in other contexts. And it's, it, it is a fact of California law that a self-insured provider is able to provide an insurance certificate and the city will accept that insurance certificate and it, and it meets the requirements of the ordinance. Uh, it is also a fact that your city engineer, who I've never met, but if he's like every other city engineer, part of his job is to be tasked with understanding, you know, would a bond do or would a cash deposit do and how much would be required. And you could, should you choose to, but, but it's not sort of the scope of this ordinance, you could decide to try and set some parameters around his authority. But I, I suggest to you that, that the, the number of permutations and combinations of different facts and circumstances that he has to evaluate in making those decisions, he or she has to evaluate in making those decisions and make it a very difficult exercise. And you would be fixing a problem that doesn't exist because as far as we know, the wireless carriers have never had a problem with being required to put down a cash deposit and having that kind of dispute here in Glendale. It may have happened in other communities, but not here. Um, Mr. McMahon, I, I thought, spoke really eloquently um, about uh, the need for us to identify the protections that are available for homes. Uh, I think I covered that at the start of my comments by talking about the right-of-way issues, but to make sure that I've addressed, at times he seemed to also be suggesting, and, and I think one of the commissioners suggested that an issue could also arise if somebody chose to put a wireless facility in their backyard for cash, uh, that facility would still go through a permitting and approval process through the city, the one that's described in this ordinance. And the community compatibility is a very strong portion of the evaluation that gets <laughs> So I would expect that that type of application, were it to occur in a residential neighborhood or a facility in somebody's backyard, would, would be significantly scrutinized through the city processes. Um, Mr. Hunt uh, made, uh, he, he said a lot of things, um, but one, only one that I viewed as uh, a, sort of a legal issue. He made a comment to you that setbacks had been upheld by uh, the court in the San Diego decision. Uh, and I just want you to understand, because you, you may hear more about the San Diego decision over time, 
San Diego decision was a challenge to the face of the ordinance, not to a specific application. And so what the court said in that case is, you could put a setback requirement in an ordinance. We're not saying that if somebody brought an application in and you applied your setback requirement as an excuse to deny the application, that you'd win that lawsuit, local agency. But if you want to just put a setback requirement in your ordinance, you can do that. And we talked about that previously, about this the escape valve uh, concept for such a provision. Um, Jamie Hall did, no, did uh, from the California Wireless Association, did talk to you a little bit about the shot clock rules. Uh, and I think generally the things he said about the shot clock were correct, other than I think there's a debate in the community at large right now about whether the shot clock is effective or not effective because there's a, there has been an appeal of the decision of the FCC to a higher court. Um, and in any event, there's no real indication of, um, of how that shot clock rule would get applied in a context where, as here, you have a moratorium. Uh, and you have a moratorium for a good reason in, in this process to draft a new ordinance. So as, as I told you before, the shot clock creates a presumption that you've unreasonably delayed if you go beyond 90 days in the case of a co-location or 150 days in the case of uh, a new facility. But that presumption can be overcome. And I would expect that one thing that could overcome that presumption would be the existence of a moratorium uh, in this case. And another thing, uh, Commissioner Landrigan, because Landrigan, sorry, I apologize, uh, is is the CEQA process. Um, and because the shot clock is so new, reconciling the time it takes to go through the CEQA process with the timeline set forth in the shot clock process, I think, is something that is going to take some time to figure out. Um, uh, and I think from there, the remaining commenters focused largely, if not entirely, on the, on the issue of rights of way in residential neighborhoods. That'd be Ms. Stanley, uh, Mr. Kalfayan, Mrs. Kalfayan, and Mr. Polychromos. Um, if I've missed any of their comments or I can address any issues specifically for you, I'd, I'd be happy to, or have Chris or, or Jonathan chime in. I have a question about the alternative analysis. Mm -hmm. The way it's done, um, it's all, I mean, it's done by the applicant, right? And is it reviewed by the city if all the alternatives were really exhausted? The... Um, Chris put up a PowerPoint slide earlier tonight that talked about the, the, the areas where the cities. Let me answer, answer your question first. Yes. Yeah. The city reviews the application and scrutinizes the application, satisfies itself that the information in the application is sufficient. And if it's not, it says to the applicant, well, you didn't consider this and you didn't consider that. You need to, you need to augment your analysis to deal with that. Also, her PowerPoint slide indicated that John, not Jonathan, but an expert would be available. An expert like Jonathan would be would be available uh, to review that alternatives analysis because at times that analysis is going to in, involve technical determinations about you know what's feasible technically from a building standpoint or from a radio frequency emission standpoint. Okay. I catch your question. Yeah. <coughs> One question that still is lingering, I think Ms. Daigle brought it up, is the, um, in our proposed ordinance, there is no public hearing on a public right-of-way uh, application permit. And how is that unique among the other ordinances? Is there a public um, process to hear and to comment on right-of-way uh, installations in other ordinances. This is, Why did we choose this? Th this is uh, a, a jurisdiction-specific analysis. Um, some jurisdiction, and the, and the reason it's jur jurisdiction-specific is that some jurisdictions choose to uh, regulate, have one overall regulatory mechanism that looks at wireless facilities, and it doesn't really distinguish the reviewing bodies are the same regardless of whether it's right of way or non right of way. But in Glendale, you have the Public Works Department that is responsible for the right of way and the Planning Department that's responsible for the zone property. 
And as I understand it, and Chris would probably speak better to this, but if I give my first cut at it, my first cut is that really the city's uh, decision-making infrastructure isn't really set up mm -hmm. to have that type of public hearing process on the public works side. That's correct, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Uh, the uh, public works department has never had a public hearing process. Um, with respect to encroachments in the public right-of-way. It has in other uh, contexts, such as permit parking, taxi cabs, and other um, transportation-related matters that go to the TPC, Transportation Parking Commission. So this will be a new process for the Public Works Department. The hearing is uh, would require that there be a hearing body up till now, the director of public works has made, or his or her designee has made the determination. It's what goes in the public rights of way. Usually it's a city engineer that makes the final determination based on technical and engineering issues. It doesn't mean it couldn't happen. No, no, I understand, and I'm, I'm, and I find that really curious, and, and I thought that might be the reason for it. Um, because there is a public hearing process and unfortunately it's it's an appeal it's an appeal and it's costly and it goes to the council and it seems to me that if that is the only option there might be a better option that we could look at in the ordinance the appeal process would go to the building a fire board of appeals oh, that's correct I remember they've that. not taken on these kinds of appeals before not in this context with regard to encroachments in the right-of-way they have with regard to building permits and building codes. So that would be, it, it uh, would require a new leap for them as well. But th that has been built into the proposed ordinance. Okay, I'm glad I remember that. I thank you for refreshing my dying brain cells. <laughs> <laughs> I might ask for a break after this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think all our brains are fried. All yeah. right. <laughs> Courage. <laughs> um, concluding remarks. Have we covered the comments, questions? Yeah, I've covered all of the notes that I took. Um, if I missed anything uh, that you'd like addressed, I'd be happy to try and, and hit it. Mr. Kramer may have some closing remarks. Oh. Maybe he was just adjusting it. <laughs> I mean, m most of us in this room after five or six hours would like to adjust our seats a little. Good morning. Yeah. <laughs> Keep this very Happy brief. Happy Valentine's Day. Uh, uh, very short. Uh, Mr. Roach's concern regarding the noticing, uh, regarding the compliance notices. First off, the carriers do not submit specific site site specific notices to the FCC about compliance. Uh, so what we're asking for is not duplicated work that goes to the FCC. They don't review it. <coughs> what we're asking for, and this is in section 30.48.080 on page 90, is simply for a annual notice to us of compliance. Now. The reason we did this is because some sites under the FCC rules are categorically excluded. They're presumed safe because of their height, the power output, things like that. We have the option through the planning process to require more specific types of reports, and San Francisco does more extensive work. So we're not asking for anything that other jurisdictions, frankly, are asking more of. But I just wanted to clarify that point. Um, the Issues that have been raised on significant gap have been already covered. I won't go into more other than the fact that at this point, we don't have the guidance from the courts, as Jeff has said. Um, this is a changing territory, and the carriers are, are wanting to change the discussion regarding significant gap from the provision of radio signal over an area to the provision of service which unfortunately gives us pause, obviously, because it simply says the carrier can say, okay, this is enough today and tomorrow we're going to come back because the significant gap we closed, we've decided it's reopened. This is the tension, the Fluid. biggest tension that we have. Um, and we have not tried to over-regulate that, but nor have we tried to under-regulate that in this process. We've simply tried to collect information and leave the process open so we can address it. Um, 
like to thank uh, Ms. Daigle and Mr. McMahon, one after the other, for kind words. <laughs> I don't normally get that at hearings like this, so I was very pleased. But I, I, I do want to stress that the, I think Mr. McMahon really uh, raised a good point. And this is a process that is city driven. Jeff and I work for many cities, many of them together, many of them separately. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to live with this, which is why we are here to provide the guidance as opposed to telling you what you have to do, uh, except for the core legal issues that Jeff's already talked about. I think, frankly, uh, those are all the issues that Jeff hasn't talked about. Of course, I'm available for additional questions as well. Any questions for the speaker at this time? I don't know. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Concluding remarks from staff. Mr. Chair, members of the commission, I, I just want to reiterate that there, we are restricted in quite a few ways by the law, by the preemption laws and federal and state state laws, as um, Jeff Melching has so ably reviewed for you. And your staff report goes into even more detail about the preemption uh, that occurs um, with regard to wireless antennas. Um, within that context, we have worked with staff, planning and, and public works staff, to develop an ordinance that we believe the council wants to see to restrict uh, the placement of antennas in undesirable locations to the greatest extent that uh, is possible under the law. And there is the loophole that's already built into to the law. If we want to call it a loophole, I, I'd prefer to call it, um, you know, in a last uh, reasonable effort. Um, if if there is a significant gap, true significant gap that cannot be covered by any other means, and, and the antenna has been developed, has been camouflaged, and is at least an intrusive means then there is a provision that allows for the antenna to be placed. But, but there, are re, there are requirements um, in the application process that allow the decision makers to take all factors into consideration. That's why the application process is so detailed in the ordinance. That's also to give the carriers the opportunity to know what is required. There's, there's no questions here about what we will be looking at. We wanted to spell that out. Much of this information is already requested on an informal basis by Public Works, uh, for example, so that they can help a carrier site a, a, a facility at, that is the least intrusive means. What we've done is spell out in just in more detail what is required so that everybody's on notice. All right. Any questions from the commission? Okay. Our our um, direction here is to provide a motion that we review the amendments uh, reviewed the amendments, and uh, we're going to provide a recommendation to city council. Now, I'm going to presuppose that as a commission, we're all at least uh, generally supportive of the um, of the uh, proposed um, general plan amendment. And what I'm going to do then in the course of the motion is say, is basically at the end of our conversation is we'll make a motion that we're generally supportive and that council sh should please note the following uh, individual or collective comments from the commission. Mm -hmm. So with that said, maybe we can just start and, and everyone can kind of sound off about what their thoughts are and, and so on. Mr. Sheets. Well, well said. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How do we start? <laughs> My gosh, I'm still back on on the the low income. Uh, this is a difficult issue. I, I have a lot of concerns. Um, I have a difficult issue because I'm, I'm from the industry and I've dealt with these exact issues and it's been unclear, undefined, 
mainly in the wired area as far as placing of supportive equipment and cabinets. And and now we go we went into wireless the mm. same way I, the industry did. And because of that, uh, and I don't think there was the intention wasn't to be uh, vague or sh not forthcoming, but it was the procedure, it was the standard, and and the industry was allowed to do what they wanted. And now we've come to a place that uh, I think if the industry would have been smart, they would have at least tried to open the doors earlier. So I, I have difficulty based on what Mr. McMahon stated as far as the whole reason this issue came about was about residential placement and 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 some standards around that, and I'm not seeing it. Um, and I don't know how we'll get there because, uh, you know, because of that, the burden uh, is greater for vendors now, and they need to continue communicating with and educating of, of the city and, and the citizens. But even the carriers can disagree which shows the whole decision-making process is, is fluid. It, it can change. It's, it, it's, not, it's not exactly what we're seeing. It's like smoke and mirrors. This is what we want to present to you. So that's what you, in the past, this is what we want to present to you, and this is what you have to f agree with or you have to accept. And that makes it difficult for me to see an end or a solution <laughs> to this process. I think where we are now is there, we have a voice and we want to use it, and we're just not sure how much of it we can use or what strength we can put into it. Uh, but I, it's somewhere around alternatives and, op, or alternatives and options and, and having that presented in a cohesive fashion to us so we can make the right decisions. Um, I'm smart enough to know that these these units have to go in, but I'm stuck. I'm stuck with the uh, being a citizen and a homeowner as to how we do that and how I define it, and if there's anything that uh, defines or opens the door for not in my backyard. This this is it. This is the baby. So um, I'm in I'm in support of what what I've seen in the legislation. I went to I think two of the the uh, the meetings the hearings that were had. It's I think it's very clear, very concise, a lot of hard work. Um, I'm okay with that, and I am I'm okay to move that along. But I'm not okay with what's what I think is missing or what what I think is not there. I don't know what that is, but I, some clarity and some definition and some agreement. <laughs> On where these things go relative to the homes, and uh, I'm not I'm not sure where I'm going with this, this final decision. But my my assumption, not my assumption, my sense is that something needs to happen with the vendors and and the community about here's what we need to do. Here's our best choices and best options. What can you live with? <laughs> Thought, I thought initially that what we would come out of this with was here are some definitions or some guidelines as to where things can go and can't go, and I, I don't sense that's there uh, after a lot of hard work. So um, I guess what I'm saying is I'm, I'm in support of the legislation, but I'm not sure what, I'm, what I would like to add to it or ask that we put into it to send to the council. That's kind of where I am right now. Thank you, Mr. Sheets. Mr. Lee? Yes. Um, you know, throughout the whole hearing, I see this as a uh, very complex uh, issue. And uh, there's no perfect uh, solution uh, to, to this issue. And what it sounds like is that what's good today uh, will change tomorrow anyways, uh, so dynamic the industry is. Um, and the questions I had or the questions that was raised by the, uh, the speakers uh, were, in my opinion, uh, were all uh, adequately answered. And I think this ordinance uh, was really uh, 
you did an excellent job of preparing the consultants and the and the staff. Um, I am supportive of it. Um, if I do want to add one thing, um, I did not receive um, concrete argument as to if we were to put in this 15 feet or 75 percent uh, setback in the residence area, uh, that this would create a problem. I did not get that from the uh, consultants. So I'd like to see that, um, you know, imposed uh, or, you know, uh, included in the ordinance. Uh, but uh, as far as um, uh, this, you know, we do need to have a set of rules. We do need to have a, uh, you know, moratorium uh, lifted and, uh, you know, put our, set our foot down and set the ordinance so that uh, we have guidelines in the city. So I'm supportive of this ordinance uh, with that one uh, comment that I made. All right. What you saying? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm definitely supportive of the ordinance as well. Uh, we've had a year moratorium on this, um, and the reason we've had it is because of, you know, it's, it hasn't been for the, for the telecommunication companies, but it's been for the residents, and so we can develop this ordinance. Um, and I think the ordinance does, I think the staff has worked exceptionally hard to create something that puts in place enough conditions where the last resort, as far as the analysis goes and the alternatives go, the last resort will be doing anything in the residential. Yeah, maybe we could do more here and there, um, and I think those might be minor. And I don't really have any very good recommendation to maybe help that. I didn't. I heard some things. Um, I didn't hear very specific things. Um, I know there's you know the issues of maybe a water tank taking that out of it. And I think if it's something so damaging, um, as far as putting, you know, using water tank as a co-location, then that's part of the alternative analysis. And I think that would be something considered as a last resort if it's gonna be so damaging. And I, I like the general approach we're taking with the ordinance and I'm, I'm gonna be very, and I'm supportive of that um, based on, uh, the work done and the recommendations <coughs> done so far. That's it. Thank you. Ms. Landrigan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and fellow commissioners. Um, I, I think the ordinance is fairly comprehensive. I think there's some areas <coughs> that um, still, to me, I'd like to have addressed. And I think Ms. Stanley uh, came up and, and I had already made some notes on this that... Um, Slope, contours, trees, topography, and any um, any earth moving event or any earth changing that occurs in any of the areas that are um, not residential or adjacent to residential need to be part of the application process. I think those are, those are necessary. I also um, <coughs> concur. To me, the, the fact is is that as a tower becomes taller, it becomes more visibly uh, uh, a concern at, to more residents and that radi uh, the uh, radius map needs to extend. And if it's a small area that <coughs> is within the height limits, I think that maybe 500 feet is fine. But I think seriously, in some instances, if you look at the the towers that are over by Minks that are not even in Glendale, but they're adjacent to Glendale and Eagle Rock. You can see them from downtown L.A. No, I'm kidding. But Thank you, Eagle Rock. <laughs> we do have, I mean, I think that when you have a larger vid visual impact, that the impact on the neighborhood and the ability to include more neighbors who are visually impacted by it needs to be addressed, and that's not addressed in here. I'm not saying it should be a sliding uh, radius map, but maybe I am. Maybe I'm saying is that if if you uh, go so high, you have to uh, increase your radius. So because you've affected more people, I think really the public review and uh, the visual neighborhood context needs to include as many affected individuals as possible. So I think that is a, a, an area that needs to be expanded upon. And uh, if we can't deal with uh, Mr. Um, Mann's 
comment, which is the 75% of tower height or 15 feet, whichever is larger, then I think that in the uh, PROW, the public right-of-way, which I've always called just the uh, right-of-way, but uh, <laughs> since we now have a prow instead of a row, <laughs> uh, I think we should uh, address the fact that any, um, and, and it does almost in the 1,000-foot element, but I don't know if that is... Uh, you know, the tipping point that says that anything that is within uh, a thousand feet of a residential neighborhood requires a, a public hearing. I think that would solve the problem as opposed to the uh, setback, and, and that might be something we should consider. Those are the weakest elements, and I think that they were pretty well voiced by the community, and I I, I'm looking for that I tower coming out next year from uh, AT and T and Mr. Jobs and um, I, I have to tell you that seriously we used to have telephones that you carried around that were bigger than most women's purses today's and now they fit in you know we used to have transistor radios when I was a kid that was the highlight of my Christmas gift and now these little nanos do everything including count how many steps you take. And, uh, you know, I'm challenging the industry to to prove me right that there are better ways to do this and that you will do it. And that's, those are my comments. Thank you. Technology-wise, I'm told there was once something called black and white TV. <laughs> and, um, one, of the, one of the problems we have is that there's, the word's been bandied about a number of times, there's proliferation. And just like too much of a good thing, you know, straws on a camel's back, you know, one extra piece, you know, too many pieces of cake, whatever, when things proliferate too much, they, you know, they're no longer a benefit to, to the, uh, the neighborhood. Um, you know, you can make the arguments, oh, people want their cell phones and so on, but at some point, it becomes overbearing. You know, it sounds to me like the technology is eventually going to be like wireless routers. It's kind of spouting up where every house will be its own little cell tower. But, you know, we'll get there eventually. The, this is a restrictive um, ordinance. Um, but it's no more restrictive than what the federal government and the state government has pushed on communities. And because of a not with the individuals that have spoken to us today, but let's say previous cell phone companies or or individuals within their organizations, there's a there's a corporate arrogance and a sense of entitlement. And just like in the movies There Will Be Blood where or where Standard Oil used to throw up a hundred, you know, derricks outside somebody's house, at some point communities push back. And when the federal government and the state government pushes and people suddenly get get notified like the night before our cell tower is about to go up in their yard, there's going to be community outrage, and that's what you're seeing. So this is a restrictive ordinance, but I don't think it's severely restrictive. Now, are there things that are going to be tweaked and there's legal things that are going to pop up that are going to change this? Yes. But the only reason we're facing this is because of the behavior of certain organizations. And because of that, now the community is going to stand up and say, enough is enough. We're going to make you go through these steps to really prove it, and we're going to do some things that are going to force you to become good neighbors. I mean, fundamentally, you want to be good neighbors because a good neighbor makes money. So we're going to help you do that. Um, I There's only a few things that I heard that got pointed out that, that I would comment on. The, the, con the, uh, the conversation about how large the notification area should be that you were just talking about, Commissioner Landegren. Um, I think it best be left at the 500 and then to the discretion of the director because we could spend tens of thousands of dollars trying to figure out some sort of sliding scale and, and so on. And I think we just need to leave it up to the good graces of staff to realize when notification needs to be expanded rather than try to create some formula. I think it would just be unnecessary work. Although I do think that that, that, that desire, that ability to expand it is, is critical. So uh, flexibility. It, absolutely right. Um, I, I like the phrase you said, neighborhood context. Um, the setback aspect of it, I, I hear it both ways. Um, I think that would be one of those, uh, my fear about putting it in would just be how, uh, that might just be something else for a court challenge. But by the same token, 
you know, I'd be willing to hear the conversation, and I think council is going to be sensitive to that as well. I mean, it's clearly a, a, um, a hot button on the part of a, a number of the community members. So as this goes to council, I would urge staff and the consultants to just be really a lot more clear, have visuals, um, you know, scenarios, paint the picture, because we all have a slightly different idea. Um, I think a simple rendering doesn't have to be full color or anything, but a simple rendering of the type of installation uh, on a posting is not a bad idea. You know, let people know what they're in for. Um, you know, people aren't going to panic if it's a small little utility box. People are going to go absolutely insane if it's a huge facility. Um, I would like to know uh, if there's a projection of how many applications the Planning Commission is actually going to see over the next year, two years, three years. Uh, if there's any sort of projection, just so that we can kind of think about workload and, and whether there are ways to work around that. And, uh, and I totally agree with the idea that the mapping needs to involve contours, grading plans, and so on. So um, in a nutshell, did, in the course of the um, latter uh, conversations, did any of the uh, um, commissioners' early deliberations, is there anything anybody wants to add? Any comments from staff in regards to what they've heard? Oh, please, Mr. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if this was mentioned. Uh, you know, uh, when you talk about monopoles in uh, Class 4, uh, do we talk about monopines and uh, monopalms where that, you know, aesthetically, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, are we increasing that or? Mr. Hagan. Yes, uh, I would like to address something about the noticing and um, I, I would like the community to know that any organization, the city or any community organization who wishes to be notified of all of our discretionary hearings, all they need to do is give us a name. We, uh, as a practice, we send uh, a notice to uh, the organization and a contact person in the organization, and they can or, uh, they notify their memberships of all of our discretionary review permits. We do that already. Also, on our website, there is a Google map that you can go, and every project that's in process, you, there is a bubble for it. You can click on it. The information is there, and that includes everything regarding to cell towers that require a discretionary review process. I think Mr. Foy has an estimated number of the applications in the residential zone that uh, we have received based on our experience in the, in the last year. Yeah, in the uh, private property residential zones, we get about four or five applications a year. Okay. Uh, they tend to be often uh, far up into the hillsides. We have a few residentially zoned properties, maybe a couple more in the SR zones, which you're already familiar with. Yeah, we, get, we see those anyway. Uh, although, I mean, we're told changes are coming, but I, I don't care to predict the future myself. I guess all I'd say, if the future holds a significant change in our workload, we'll just figure out what makes the most sense. We'll double our pay. Exactly. <laughs> well, we, we, we've already doubled our meetings. So. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, any other comments from staff? Any comments from commissioners? I guess I would just suggest that someone make a motion uh, that we do uh, recommend the, the proposed amendments and that council notes our comments during deliberations. So moved. Do I have to read it? No, I think that probably okay. covered it. Second. <coughs> Anything after 10 o'clock, we really start sliding. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, was that a second? Second. A motion in support. Could you call roll, please? Commissioner Landrigan? Yes. Commissioner Lee? Yes. Commissioner Yesaya? Yes. Commissioner Schitz? Aye. And Chair Kane. Uh, and a vote of five to zero, the commission has recommended that City Council adopt the uh, new general plan amendment cases uh, PGP 2010-001 and PZON 2010-001 uh, and make note of Commissioner's comments. Um, I would like to suggest to my fellow commissioners that agenda item 7B, Zoning Code Amendment, Case PZON 2009-007, be continued to a date certain. So moved. Mr. Hagani? I would recommend a date certain be your next Planning Commission meeting on the 17th of February. What, what do we have on the next Commission uh, meeting? You have a few other items, but the following meetings are more packed, <laughs> so we, we suggest you move on. And this will be a, this could be it's, a quick it's, item, it's depending brief, on. It's but it's That's right. Right, yes. right. Understood. So moved. Okay. Second. We have a motion. We have a motion. Support call roll. 
Commissioner Landrigan? Yes. Commissioner Lee? Aye. Commissioner Yesayan? Yes. Commissioner Schitt? Aye. And Chair Kane? Aye. And a vote of 5 to 0, the Zoning Code Amendment, Case PZON 2009-007, is continued to the Fe February 17th meeting without further notice. Planning Department updates. It's late. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Under comments from commissioners, we agree. So, uh, anything from the commissioners? <laughs> Hungry. All right. Uh, motion to adjourn? So moved. Yes. We are adjourned. Uh, Thank you.